It's my privilege to uh, read for you uh, the old, old story uh, from Luke chapter 2. And um, I know that you're familiar with it, and I know a lot of you have heard it many, many times as I have. And uh, I always pray uh, that the Lord will uh, speak fresh uh, each and every time I read something like this. This is a, um, an historic event that happened um, and not only from an earthly perspective, but from a redemption history perspective, uh, this is an amazing thing that happened, that God became one of us. And uh, he did it for a reason. He came on purpose. He came with intention. Uh, he didn't have to. He didn't owe it to us. It's not that we deserved it, uh, but he came. And because of his amazing love and, uh, for you and for me, he came to bring salvation to us. It, is recorded for us by Luke, and it goes like this. It came about in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All were proceeding to register for the census, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. And it came about that while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there's been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. And it came about when the angel had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in haste and they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were wondering at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured up all of these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned. They went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told to them. This is the word of the Lord. Let's stand as we sing.
guys. Thanks for leading us. Well, we love these old songs. We love this old story, and we want to reflect just a little bit on its meaning and significance uh, for the next few minutes, if you don't mind. I hope you're having a, a blessed Christmas time. The promise, the hope uh, of God's amazing uh, grace and love uh, to sinners such as we are uh, is such good news that we gather once a year to remind ourselves that He came. Uh, that he, he came to save, 
And uh, those of us that understand we need his salvation and we need his gift of grace um, are, are well aware of, of how important that is. And that's what gives rise to rejoice, rejoice. I don't know about you, but I, I, I know a lot of these old carols, and, and I think you've sung a lot of them as well. Uh, Sean and I were just sitting over here, and we don't know the words to the verses of that last one. So, so we were just kind of going, ah, 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 ah. but we got the rejoice part because that's rejoice. And man, we were just having a big time over there rejoicing. I, I don't know. But when it gets to that part, I'm like ready to shout it out. Emmanuel, God with us, okay? Um, uh, our, our Christ, our, uh, it's the Greek version of the Hebrew, Messiah. So our Christ, our Messiah, our Savior, our Deliverer has come. Uh, and this is really great news, uh, especially, as I say, when you're aware of the fact that you have a need for such a thing. Now, I believe, uh, as a pastor, as a Bible teacher, I believe that celebration is natural for the human soul, that God actually designed us with the idea that we would celebrate, that we would rejoice, um, that we, um, along with worship, he's written that into the very fabric of who we are. Um, I think you think that, too. If, 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 if you think we were created for celebration, please give me at least a Methodist amen. amen. All right. Oh, that's good. That's almost Pentecostal. All right. And um, we're, we're here uh, tonight to remind ourselves of, of that fact and then the fact that Christ has given us a reason to rejoice. All at Advent season, we've had four weeks together, four Sundays in our normal worship services here, where we've focused in on the love of God um, the hope that is brought to us in Christ, the joy that is on offer to us uh, in a relationship where we're set free in Christ, and to the peace uh, that comes to us through Christ as well, peace with God, the peace of God, uh, peace with others that can even be found in a, when we have a right relationship with God, we, it begins to affect, it, it, it can't perfect all of our relationship with others because there are others that don't believe in God and don't want to trust in God or, or, or worship God or acknowledge Him. But it begins to affect the way we see each other, one another in our relationships, and there's even more peace there and even more peace within ourselves. So we have this great need, and yet we come to this season, and I know a lot of us, you know, from time to time and from different years, will come, some will come with just really excited, really full of celebration, all that sort of thing. Others will come to a season like this, and it'll be the, f the first time without somebody that they've known and loved uh, deeply for a long, long time. Or, or others will come to the Christmas season um, having lost a job or, or having lost a dream or some hope that they uh, thought would, would, uh, would, would come and materialize in their life in the past year, and it has not. And so I think what we want to say when we come together at Christmas Eve and when we come together even in our Sunday services is that we live in a broken world, and in our broken world, sometimes even a season like this is hard for some people, and we understand that. Uh, even Jesus wept at the grave of his good friend Lazarus. And some of us here, some of us, are at, in a place in our lives right now where um, there is some cause for a sobering, if you will, of, of our moods, but that need not steal uh, the joy that's on offer to us from Jesus and, and the peace and the hope and, and the great love that God has uh, lavished upon us. So um, I, I think the, the ones though that for me, my heart breaks over the most are the people who have a lot of earthly reasons to rejoice, but they aren't rejoicing because everything um, has for them become lackluster. Everything for them has sort of grown dull, including when they hear the Christmas story, including when they hear the good news of God's grace on offer through faith in Christ. And that is probably the saddest place to be in a place where um, you, you, you either don't want to hear it or you're turning away from it or refusing it in some way. If, if that's you and you're here tonight, I, I want you to know, I, I've been there. We, uh, most all of us would acknowledge that we've been there from time to time. My spiritual life undulates and my moods go crazy, you know, all over the place, but my spiritual life undulates too, and, and it's up and down sometimes. But I think David Mathis said it really well when he said, few things are more tragic than taking Christmas in stride. It's spirit and magic, that alluring sense of supernatural goodness are not just for children, but even for grown-ups, especially for grown-ups. God forbid that we ever get used to Christmas. So I, maybe like you, I, I come here tonight, I, I don't want to get used to Christmas. 
I want to be surprised by Christmas. I, I, I want to be filled with wonder at Christmas as well. And I don't want to grow so old that I can no longer, and I'm talking about internally, not physically. I don't want to internally grow so old, cold, and rusty in my soul that I no longer have the capacity for wonder or the capacity for astonishment. And you read through the gospel records, you, you, you read about Jesus' teaching, and you read over and over again how the people were filled with, they were astonished, and they were filled with wonder at his teaching and at his stories and, and everything he had to say, the great, beautiful, great news that he had to bring to them. So in Luke uh, chapter 2, we read the story of uh, the coming of Christ, the, the, the birth of Christ, and the shepherds on the hillside. And, and there's so much about it, I think, that's awesome. Um, as Bible-believing Christians uh, here at the Village Chapel, we have a high view of Scripture. We believe God's inspired these, uh, these ancient texts. And they're, uh, this, this uh, collection of books, 66 ancient books, uh, is wide and, and varied in its literary style. There's poetry, there's historical narrative, there's uh, epistles or letters, ancient letters that were written to individuals, some written to whole churches, some written to groups of churches. So it's a really, it's an awesome library of material to read if you want to uh, sort of get inside of, of what God has, has preserved for us over time as his word to us. Um, but we have a high view of Scripture. We, we believe that when uh, God inspired Luke to, to write this, uh, we think it's awesome because he, this medical professional, this man of science, is tasked with telling all of us that a virgin had a kid. Isn't that awesome? That's great, because you know he would have pushed back on that one, right? You know, he would have pushed back for detail. He was so, wait a minute, hold on, hold on, hold on, say, I know how this works, and that's not how this works, you know? And I love it that Luke, uh, also, as far as I know, the only Gentile to write a book of the New Testament, it, he, I love it that he is the one that, that God chooses to record this story with the shepherds and, and them coming to the manger and, and, and coming to see uh, the, the, the Christ child, the ones who saw and heard the angels. That's just awesome to me because a man of science, again, a man of the physical sciences would generally be the one to push back on all that and press a little harder. But we know from the beginning of his book, Luke chapter 1, that he wanted to write, uh, he wanted to research so carefully and write the exact truth about the things that happen. And so I love that. Uh, he records for us what is um, a landslide of redeeming love, the inauguration of God's kingdom uh, with the birth of Christ, the beginning of God's reversal of all that is wrong with our broken world. A single angel splits the night sky over where some shepherds are just doing their everyday job. Uh, they, to our knowledge, they were simply there punching their time card, doing their gig. They weren't looking for God. They weren't sending up, you know, they, didn't, they hadn't built a fire, sending up smoke signals, trying to arouse the deity in some way. Uh, they're just out there watching their flocks by night. And, and this angel splits the night sky and begins to sing and declare. And he begins with this, I love the way that he began because they were terribly frightened, verse 9 tells us, and the angel said to them, don't be afraid. And, and, and that's, as we point out so often here at the Village Chapel, if you're a visitor, you need to know this. The most often repeated command in the Bible is don't be afraid. It's not don't drink. It's not don't have wassail. It's not don't don't buy presents. It's, it's not don't have a Christmas tree. Look, we're all into that, right? Okay. So it's not that. It's don't be afraid. They're most often repeated command in Scripture. Um, are there things that he doesn't want us to do? Sure there are. Yeah, he knows that there are some things in this life that are, that are bad for his children and that are destructive for his children. So he makes that clear. Uh, but the most often repeated command is don't be afraid. And I love that about the Bible. I love that about the God of the Bible. And I love to tell people that about the God of the Bible because a lot of people out there in the, in the world of haven't, I haven't read the Bible before, a lot of them think that the Bible is just about a God who's a troll under a bridge waiting for you to try to cross the bridge so he can smash you. Or, or the killjoy, you know, God up in the sky that's waiting to look down and see you having any kind of fun whatsoever so that he can stop you from that fun. 
Um, but no, we're called to rejoice in him, to delight in him, to exalt in him, and certainly to not be afraid. It's so important uh, for him. Now, it's at least worth noticing who the angels showed up to, who God sent these angels to, uh, these shepherds. He, he, he didn't send them to political power brokers, didn't send them to really advanced theologians or, or religious leaders of the highest caliber, pastors of churches, or any of that sort of thing shepherds out in the field, probably looked down on in their culture in general, kind of low class, you know, kind of guys that couldn't get a real job, you know, like, so some of you musicians relate to that, right? <laughs> probably the people that are like out there that just couldn't get a break, and so they're out there and just watching over sheep, okay? And, but they're doing their job. They're, they're, they're plugging away out there. And I love it that the, that the Lord said, go, hey, go tell those guys. Let's start there. And that Christ wasn't born in a palace, wasn't, wasn't born to the present-day power broker king, but came to a peasant virgin, um, which made the conception and, 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 and this birth an amazing miracle that we can't really explain, this incarnation, this, this God-man, this, this Jesus who's both God and man. And he, when you think about it, he had to be. To be able to represent us on the cross, he had to be one of us. But to be holy, to live a sinless life, and to be able to represent us on the cross and actually pay the price for our sins and not for his sins, he had to be divine. He had to be able to live a sinless life. So it makes sense when you think about it. It really does kind of come together, and it's really an amazing miracle. God sent these angels uh, to bring this great news to some guys that weren't even looking for it. Like I said, and maybe you're here tonight. Maybe, maybe you're not even looking for it tonight. Maybe you just kind of want to go through. You're just checking the box, Christmas Eve, go to a Christmas candle. Oh, candles, let's go there. They're going to sing Christmas carol. I love the warm, fuzzy feeling of all that. And I do too. I do too. But there's a, it points to something greater than just the warm, fuzzy. The lights of these candles point to something much greater than just twinkly, sparkly, you know? They point to a light that has come into the darkness of our souls, a darkness that we were trapped in, a, a darkness that we were dead in our sins in, and God chose to pierce the night darkness of my soul, and then, just like he did the night with those shepherds out in the fields. Luke records for us, I think, some of God's intentions. He wanted to make sure they knew it was a divine message, divine source, divinely sourced message. So it was angels up in the heavens singing, a multitude of angels, very unique in the Bible to have a, a, an angelic choir. This doesn't happen very often at all. Angels appear often, but not a choir like this. Um, and so with the birth of the king of kings, the king of the universe, the creator of the universe, with his birth, it ought to be special. It ought to be unusual. It ought to even be unexplainable. And in some cases, for some people, just mind-blowing, heart-pounding sort of stuff. And that's what it really is. Christmas reminds us that as we receive and believe the gospel, that while we are great sinners, God's love for us is greater still. And his grace is broader and deeper than all my sin and all of your sin as well. I'll put up on the screen just a few things. We've been looking at it, Advent, the uh, numbers two through um, six up there, that with the coming of Christ, what has been put on offer for us is this unconditional love, inextinguishable hope, inexhaustible joy, and unshakable peace. Because all of it is sourced in Christ and not in ourselves or not in something finite that we happen to attach our affections to. It might be good things, but we attach our affections to our jobs, our job opportunities, our relationships with humans, um, our, our, our children, our parents, our brothers and sisters, whatever, music, art, whatever it might be. We attach our affections to a lot of things, but they were never meant to be the center, the main thing. Christ, on the other hand, is meant to be preeminent. And when he's preeminent, we hold him high. When we, give, when we sing Gloria to him, giving him glory, like these shepherds did at the end of the story, uh, we're doing that which we were actually designed to do. And we move from fear to glory, as number one up there on the screen says. So that's what happened with these shepherds. They're trembling in fear, verse 9, and the angel immediately says, don't be afraid. Now, the fear of the Lord is a good thing. When you have the fear of the Lord, the healthy fear of the Lord, you need not have an unhealthy fear of anything, including death itself, physical death, uh, because you know you belong to him, and he's granted you eternal life in Christ. 
and because of what Christ has done. So, so that's, we need not have an unhealthy fear of anything else. We have a healthy fear of the Lord. But we're moved from this afraidness, this sort of cowering and fear thing, to this glory thing like the shepherds were, where you not just see, not just hear his glory, but you actually experience his glory. It moved them in such a way that they were transformed from indifferent shepherds out there just doing their job, not really looking for anything about God, not really seeking. It moved them, this glory did, when they experienced this glory, the message of the angels and the, re- the declaration of the angels that a Savior had come, it stirred hope within them. It stirred them to want to experience this glory. And they immediately, with great enthusiasm and eagerness, ran to Bethlehem to see what these angels were talking about. So they experienced God's unconditional love, an extinguishable hope, an exhaustible joy, an unshakable peace. And then their response, their final response, verse 20, this transforming worship thing that happened to them. Again, our affections, if we set our affections and our, our, the direction of our worship on our job, our job will eventually fail us in some way. We'll find it boring. We'll have a failure in it. We might even get fired or lose our job or that. Anything can happen with finite things. They can all at some point run out of gas and steam to, to be our joy, to be our deepest delight. And so we were never meant to really set our worship on finite things, but rather on the infinite God who created us. We were designed to worship. And every single person in this room is a worshiper, whether you know it or not. You're worshiping something. The question is, is it your king? And who who is your king or what is your king? You've got one. You're worshiping one. What is it? And we're calling ourselves, as we gather together during Christmas, we're calling ourselves to remember the king of kings has come. The prince of peace has come. The one who is so eager to forgive us all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He has come for us. And he came on his own initiative because of his own unbounded love for you and his unconditional love for you. So I can say to every sinner in this room, no matter how heinous you think your sin is, no matter how unbelievably horrible you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter how far you've run away from God or how indifferent you've been toward God for however long it's been that you've been indifferent to God, I can say he is eager to welcome you home. He's eager to welcome you back, uh, to belong to him, to know his grace, to be redeemed uh, by his grace. I want to close with just three little quotes from three of my favorite authors and theologian types. J.I. Packer said the Christmas message is that there's hope for a ruined humanity, hope for a pardon, hope of peace with God, hope of glory. Sometimes you ever feel like the world is ruined, the world around us? I mean, in their day, they probably felt that way. Oppressive Roman government over top of Israel, just smashing them. Lots of, lots of horrible torture. Lots of stuff went on in their day and time that is, to us, just completely un... We wouldn't believe it. We wouldn't... We, we've never experienced anything like it. Might have heard about stuff going on in the world um, that is as bad, but for them, it was a reality on the ground. And so a ruined humanity, yeah. Could people, do people have a capacity for depravity? Yes, we do. All of us do. Every single one of us. You go to uh, the Yad Vashem. I've been to Israel several times and visited the Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum, each time. And I'm, I'm just shocked at our capacity for depravity on display on film and photographs and all that. It's real. Uh, it lurks right around the corner in my heart. What, you know, the darkness does. And so I'm so glad to say that the, this light of the world has come into the world and he's shattering darkness everywhere. And he's just eager to burst into your heart and to chase away or pierce the darkness that's in you as well, to bring the hope of pardon. Some of you are in here tonight, you know you need forgiveness. I don't, I don't need to tell you that. I, I, I've never, I, I'm not a good Holy Spirit at all. I've learned that one little thing. And it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict us of sin. But I know some of you understand what this means, the need for pardon. And I'm here to, t- I'm glad to tell you it's on offer. It's on offer tonight. He is eager and ready to forgive you for all 
your sin. John Piper um, also is one of the ones I wanted to share with you tonight. Christmas means that anyone anywhere of any kind, that pretty much includes all of us, anyone anywhere of any kind can turn from the treason of their sin to the true king. You mean you? Yeah. You don't know what I've done. You're right, I, I don't know what you've done. But if I haven't done it myself in days gone by or in recent days, I've at least heard about it and I've seen it crush other people's lives and hold people in the grip of addiction and the grip of control and in a sort of self-destructive path. I've seen this happen over and over again in people's lives as a pastor. And I just want you to know tonight, I have great news for you. You cannot outrun the grace of God. You can't outrun the long arms of the grace of God. I don't care what you've done. His arms are much longer than that. So why, what would, keep, what would keep you from turning to him, this one who would be your prince of peace, this one who would bring you this Christmas hope, love, joy, and peace? Finally, Tullian Chavidian, pastor down in Florida. He says, Christmas is the beachhead of God's campaign against sin and sadness, against darkness and death. Oh, wouldn't you just love to see the world rid of those things? I would. Um, everything, uh, uh, you know, about our world that's so filled with injustice, so filled with darkness, so filled with people using and abu abusing one another, all that's going to come crashing to an end when the Lord, in His sovereign providence, decides to bring the new heavens and new earth into being. And I'm so excited about that. That's awesome. The Christian faith is a forward-looking, we have a destiny and a future with the God who holds human history in His hands. And for now, he's offering all of us an opportunity to once again hear the gospel that though we are sinners dark as night, the bright light of his grace can shatter the, and melt away the darkness in your life and in mine. We just need to turn to this Christ like these shepherds did with just run to him and, and just bring him uh, glory and praise and worship him and honor him as our new king. B Christmas is indeed the beachhead of God's campaign against sin and sadness, against darkness and death. Into the darkness of our broken world has come this light, the light that is the Savior, the King, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Merry Christmas Village Chapel. Um, let's become a people believing and faithfully living out the gospel. Um, allowing the, the grace of God, uh, the love, hope, and peace of God to flood our souls and our hearts, to affect our relationships, to affect the way we work, uh, the way we create, um, the things that we delight in. And like these shepherds, may we leave this place tonight going home glorifying Him, worshiping Him, filled with the wonder of the transforming power of Jesus Christ in our lives.